Perfect. So first and foremost, I'd like to thank the organisers. And today I'm just going to give you a little vignette about a personalised medicine approach, a view from blood cancers. So I look after people with uh, leukaemia and we've been doing, I guess, personalised medicine in some form for about 30 years. So I'll just take you through a little bit of that. So of course there's a lot of emphasis on... So, so you can think of this talk as having some relevance to all cancers. It's, it's generalisable, what I'm going to say. So there's been a lot of uh, discussion in government about personalised cancer treatment. This was a parliamentary report in, uh, from the uh, Office of Science and Technology in 2012. There's been lots of stuff in the news about cancer treatments, re you know, revolutionising uh, cancer care. And even the health charities are talking, if you go to their websites, on the Macmillan website today, there's a whole set of web pages on how your cancer care can be personalised in 2019. And drug companies, of course, are really into this. So this is, I just landed on the page of Roche. This is their opening page. This is personalised healthcare. And Roche is one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the cancer space. Uh, so why has this been an exemplar or a potential exemplar? And what are the issues here? So it's really set out in this report from the government. So there are lots of new diagnostic tests which are being used to predict, well, that's not entirely true, which patients respond to certain cancer treatments. And the provision of these tests is very variable across the country. And in fact, the Royal Colleges of um, Medicine in the United Kingdom are working to try and standardise this with NHS England and with the devolved nations. Secondly, the UK is part of an international research effort, and I would suggest that actually the UK has made a contribution to cancer genetics way out of proportion to its size as a country, mainly through the Sanger Centre in Cambridge. The whole genome sequencing programme that led to the first human genome was then pointed towards cancer very, in a very focused way. And the Cancer Genome Project at the Sanger has been instrumental in unravelling the genetic basis of many cancers. And finally, there are emerging treatments, and we'll talk about that uh, in the end. And the cost of these treatments is a real issue. They're incredibly high, the markets are small, they're often not used in the NHS, and therefore the Cancer Drugs Fund, which was a very controversial fund set up by David Cameron, was then instituted and it's been reformed and redirected. Uh, but there is still a major issue here. So I'm going to focus on the disease I treat. Just as an exemplar, I'm not going to tell you everything about acute moderate leukemia today, but it's a most common aggressive uh, leukemia. And, you know, people think of leukemia as something that happens to children. That's not true. There are 230 children who get diagnosed with acute leukemia a year in the UK, and there are about 3,000 adults, and most of those adults are over the age of 60. So like all cancers, leukemia is a disease of aging. And importantly, this is survival, percent survival, in most patients, the survival rates are less than 5%. And those survival rates have not changed in the last 50 years. And patients with acute myeloid leukemia will usually die within three months of diagnosis. It is a death sentence. So over the years, in younger patients, and you'll notice that, so it's this group of patients here, we have made progress. And we've been dividing patients up on the basis of crude genetic changes just on how their chromosomes are organized when you look down a microscope. And these T's and inversions and all these sorts of things are gross chromosomal changes in a leukemic cell. And you can see that with conventional treatment, you can divide patients broadly into those who are doing not so bad, those who are doing what we call intermediate risk, and those who are doing really rather poorly. And this is with all manner of intensive treatment, stem cell transplantation, a year of therapy, all that kind of stuff. You have to be young enough to be able to tolerate this kind of treatment. 
But this is personalised to some extent, and this has been going on for a very long time. But the genetic revolution in the last 20 years has moved from looking at chromosomes to looking at individual genes. And this is the genetic makeup of uh, AML in younger patients. Older patients have a slightly different mix of genes that are mutated, but the pattern is what's important. Forget the colors. Just see on the x-axis the number of genes that are mutated in acute myeloid leukemia. There are over 50 that are mutated at more than 5%. And this is one of the most simple cancers. This is by far two log orders more simple than breast cancer, two log orders more simple than colorectal cancer, and yet there are 50 genes at least involved. And in most patients, there'll be four to five to six genes that are recurrently mutated, meaning they're shared between different patients, that mutation. Now, you're not born with those genetic changes. They occur in your blood cells after birth, usually from the ages of 40, 50 onwards. And there's usually a 10 or 15 year period where people don't know they're going to go towards developing acute myeloid leukemia. But these are the kinds of genes. There are many, many, many genes. I'm going to come back to this gene, FLT3. Note it's the most common. I'm also going to come back to a gene here called IDH2. Note it's in the top 10. So you can then divide patients into a pie chart, and you can say, where, do, where does my leukemia fall? Well, if you have this translocation, which is about 13% of patients, then that group of patients is subdivided by additional mutations you have. So say you have this mutation, well, it's one fifth of 13%. You start getting to very small numbers very quickly. And that means if you really want to test drugs, you have to have large international studies. And we'll come to that in the end. The days of you know, country X living in splendid isolation as members of our country do is not fit for purpose in cancer trials. So this is the genetic makeup of acute myeloid leukemia. It's very complicated. So if you really want to personalize cancer care, you're going to have to start thinking of very large population data from very large studies coming together. So let's come back to this. And let's just think about this group of patients here. They have a particular cytogenetic value of chromosome abnormality called 15, 17. So chromosome 15 and 17 are fused together. They're doing really well, actually, aren't they? Why are they doing so well? Well, it turns out the Chinese got the answer first. And many years ago, after the first description of the disease and after the first description of the chromosomal abnormality, in 1977, so people who say genetics and cancer is new, it's not new. They found out that vitamin A and vitamin A derivatives, and this was in Chinese herbal medicine, really help those cells to grow up because they're arrested in their growth. And this was the first report of a non chemotherapy agent being used to treat cancer. And it was only later when they identified the actual genes involved in this chromosome abnormality, they realized that vitamin A actually is a ligand for the retinoic acid receptor. So essentially, it was working on that translocation, those genes. And then the chemotherapy regimes we were using, vitamin A was added to it. And all of a sudden, back in the late 1990s, this became vitamin A derivatives become standard of care in our treatment regimens. Vitamin A. And then again, from Chinese reports, arsenic. Arsenic was found to be really helpful for this leukemia. And it specifically degrades the leukemic proteins in these patients. So now a combination of arsenic and vitamin A is the treatment of choice for this disease. Chemotherapy-free regimes. And now we're getting survival rates of 99.5%. If you make it through the first two weeks, you will be cured. Serendipity. Real serendipity. No big drug companies involved. Serendipity. <coughs> So now we're here, 95% of 
frontline testing. We've gone from chemotherapy alone to vitamin A plus chemotherapy, improved vitamin A dosing, de-intensifying treatment, i.e. reducing side effects, and now adding arsenic and frontline therapy. So this is a totally curable disease now. Doesn't matter what age you are, doesn't matter if you're young or old. Very few old people will get this kind of leukemia. It's mainly a young person's leukemia. And that's why it's been such a revelation for us. And it really means we have to understand the basics of the disease to really understand how to treat it properly. Okay, not listed on this slide, but just somewhere in here, you have patients who have that mutation in a gene called FLT3. And now we're getting drugs which are very specific for individual mutations. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you a randomized control trial that was done in 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine, where the first inhibitor of this gene, FLT3, was added to chemotherapy and it produced a modest survival. Though these um, may look very promising, the impact is modest. And it, it, it really benefits all patients, all different kinds of mutations in this disease. This drug is about £25,000 per year per patient. If you add on top of that the costs of treatment, in terms of chemotherapy, inpatient stay, blood products, you're talking about probably eighty to £100,000 per patient treatment costs for people with this disease. But this has now been approved by NICE, and NICE has got a commercially sensitive pricing scheme in place which is not revealed as to what they're actually paying. They're not paying the risk price. The other targeted therapy I want to talk to you about, we've been involved in very closely. About 15% of our patients have a mutation in this gene called isocitrate dehydrogenase. I'm not going to go through the science of all of this. But we've worked with a company in Cambridge, Massachusetts to develop this drug called Enosidina. And this is exquisite because it only binds the mutant protein. It does not bind the wild type protein. So in me, that drug will have no effect. It'll only work in those blood cells where the mutation is present. And it does it by keeping this mutant protein non-functional in an open configuration and there's the mutant uh, protein binding to the drug. So we now know how this drug works at an atomic resolution. But does it work in everybody? Well, it doesn't work in everybody. Even if you choose patients who have the mutation alone, so this was a trial that we did in 2017 of 176 patients, it was the first example of a drug the way we started it in phase one, i.e. the first few patients where you're looking really at safety, and we saw such good responses in a small proportion of patients. We expanded the trial, expanded the trial, and went to what was called phase two trial. And from first patient first visit to the end of the trial was about 23 months, and FDA approval was about 26 months. Because the data was so impressive, so if you take patients who've been previously treated, relapsed refractory AML, who've had two lines of prior therapy, they're 67 years old, range from 19 to 100. So these are older patients. 40% of patients responded. The median duration of response was 8.8 .8 months. And with that drug, the median duration of response was about two to three months. So it was a change. For those 40% of patients, they were living longer but not living forever. And you can see that here, in those people who didn't respond versus those people who had some kind of response to those people who had the best response, different survival curves. And what this drug is now going to be used in is combined with other therapies. You can't use it on its own, clearly. It doesn't cure everybody, and it doesn't um, work forever. So we've, for the last two slides, I just want to tell you, we're focusing really on this group of patients here, where the bulk of the disease is, and where I showed you that most of the patients really don't have a good outcome. And what we're doing is we're 
combining drugs now. And this is the way cancer therapy is going. In this issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, for example, it came out today, the advanced metastatic renal cancer, three drugs have been combined. So we're combining two drugs here. One is called venetoclax, and the other one's called azacitabine. And now if you have that FLIP3 mutation, what happens? Well, those people who have the FLIP3 mutation with that combination of drugs don't do so well. And those people who are wild type, essentially, for the FLIP3 mutation do much better. So in these patients, with that FLIP3, you now add the FLIP3 inhibitor. So you now become a triplet regime, and I'll show you that in the next slide. Similarly for the IDH mutation patients that are here, not everybody's surviving. You can add the IDH inhibitor. So you begin to combine treatments. Now you have to be careful when you combine treatments, not to combine toxicity. So the next trial will be something like this. This is now a trial that involves all of the United Kingdom, all of the United States, all of France, all of the Scandinavian countries, Australia, New Zealand, the Benelux countries. Oxford University will be sponsor, and if we crash out next week, it'll be the Berlin office of Oxford University that will be the sponsor, so that we can have EU sponsorship. And all patients will come in, they'll have a combination of venetoclax plus azacitabine and venetoclax plus C for that first treatment. We can determine the genetics of the patients then, and if they have the FLIP3 mutation, they'll get a FLIP3 inhibitor or not. If they have an IDH mutation, they'll get an IDH inhibitor or not. If they have an IDH1 mutation, there's a specific drug I haven't told you about for the IDH mutation or not and so forth. So we're really now doing combination trials based on genetics. And that's the way cancer care will go. The question for society and drug companies will be, how can you afford this? How can you afford treatments that individually will cost tens of thousands of pounds? And I think that is a real issue as we go forward in cancer care. And I'd like to stop that. Thank you very much.